thank you everyone for joining us for today's Keeping It Simple. We are delighted to have the amazing Pippa Malgrim with us today. There is no possible way that I can capture her experience and resume, but I'll give it a try. So she is a technology entrepreneur and renowned economist. She's an award-winning author and lecturer on leadership, geopolitics, and economics. Her books include The Infinite Leader, Leadership Lab, Signals, Geopolitics for Investors. She has served in numerous advisory roles for the US and UK governments. And if you haven't checked out her Substack already, please do. It's a phenomenal wealth of great information Get great information, differentiated views on everything geopolitics and global economy. She's even credited with coining the term shrinkflation. Um, so Mike Carley, if this was a fight, I would not like your odds right now, but it is a conversation. It is a friendly conversation. It is meant to be informative and entertaining conversation. It is not meant to be taken as investment advice. So there's a Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen. Um, please utilize that. We'll try and incorporate some of those questions into the conversation. And then we, we're going to start with a, uh, with a poll. Um, there's two questions in the poll. So Jimmy, if you don't mind, would you please launch that? So the two questions are, will a peace treaty be signed in the U UK, excuse me, the Ukraine-Russia conflict by the end of this year, yes or no? Uh, number two, will the US and China engage in some sort of military conflict before the end of 2025. We also did something different. We actually published this on Twitter earlier so we can compare those results. If you, if you, uh, if you voted on Twitter, feel free to do it again. That's probably not uh, statistically honest, but uh, we can compare. So uh, Jimmy, will you show us those results, please? Interesting, they're actually quite similar, aren't they? Yeah. So we saw for question one, Twitter uh, had 25% yes, so pretty close. And then for question two, Twitter had 37% yes. Also very close. Statistically, that's uh, that's remarkably close. All right. Well, listen, that is actually a good way for us to start this off. And I'm not sure if Carly's just disappeared, but um, we're going to plow ahead here. So Pippa, first of all, I just have to actually say, the reason that we have you on camera today is because you are in the United States. You took a family vacation because tonight you're going to go see the Lawrence Welk Orchestra, right? <laughs> well, here's what happened. A friend of mine is the manager for the wonderful rap artist Moss Def. And it turns out Moss Def reads my Substack column. So he reached out and he goes, listen, he loves your stuff. And he's giving you free tickets to come sit with him backstage, any concert you want. <laughs> so I went, oh my God. So I brought my daughter over and we're going to go backstage with him and Erica Badu tonight and hang out. That is awesome. That is really, really fantastic. And given the choice of any concert, you picked his over Lawrence as well. That is amazing. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have been so progressive. Um, so Pippa, we've got, uh, you know, there's, there's so many things that you and I chat about. And one of the areas that I always defer to you is in this area of geopolitics, right? Where, you know, your background is just so much more robust than mine in, in all possible ways of access. When you first started bringing up this idea of that we're effectively in World War III already. It just doesn't feel like what we imagine a war is, right? This is not U.S. troops being airlifted into Afghanistan or into the U.K. for preparation to cross, you know, the beach and land at Omaha Beach. This is a very different environment in which we're battling it out in cyberspace, we're battling it out in space, we're battling it out for infrastructure and the control of infrastructure that's happening elsewhere around the world, right? And so one of the very first things that you, you clued me into that almost no one else really was talking about were the dynamics of the communications links being severed up in the North Sea. Can you talk for a second just about what that aspect is and kind of what this current status is? Where does that leave us in infrastructure, et cetera? And are there similar developments that have happened since? Okay, yeah, absolutely. So let's back up a little bit and understand that first thing, I, in my opinion, the superpowers have been at war in space for at least the last five or six years. And the thing about space is there, there are no journalists and you know it's all classified. 
So every once in a while, you'll, you'll get a news story. And the few that we saw were things like the Russians took, um, they blew up their own military satellites. It was like a 4,000 pound machine and they smashed it to smithereens. And everybody shrugs, but what that really is about is a denial of access because it creates this massive debris field. They call it the Kessler effect and it's described as razor blades in a washing machine. And it's partly what forced the International Space Station to almost have to evacuate now a couple of times. And why? Because we're battling out over who gets to dominate which orbits because the commanding heights of modern warfare is now space. So that war in space shifted over to Earth just before the tanks rolled into Ukraine. So 50 days before on January 6th, 7th, 2020, um, somebody cut the most sophisticated, most powerful and fastest internet connection in the world, which happens to be located inside the Arctic Circle in a tiny little island called Svalbard, uh, which has a complicated history. So something more than 43 nations have a right to be there, but nominally it's Norway. And everybody's like, well, who cares? I mean, it's an island in the middle of nowhere. Well, virtually every high altitude satellite whether military or commercial, connects to Earth at Svalbard. So you cut that cable and no more satellite guidance for your military systems, you know, for, for um, missile guidance, which is a very, very big deal. And maybe because people don't really get why that's important. When I say this, they go, oh, what? No more Uber Eats, right? <laughs> because <laughs> basically this is about taking out the GPS for the entire planet. So... It was a very big deal when it happened. And the chief of the defense forces in Britain came out right away and said, this should be considered an act of war. But because then the superpowers quickly realized that we would be nose to nose in a superpower conflict directly between the United States or at least NATO and Russia, everybody went, uh, let's not go there. Let's just drop it as if it didn't happen. The public doesn't understand anyway that their internet comes from space. They think it's like electricity that comes out of a plug in the wall. So they'll never really get this and this will all just slide by. But what's actually happened is since that time, we've really been in, in uh, internet cable warfare globally, particularly the subsea cables. And many of the big ones, the public again, doesn't know much about like the Marseille cable, which connects the United States, Europe, the Middle East and Asia, that was cut. Um, We've just seen the one between the Shetland Islands and the Faroe Islands cut. And everybody goes, well, who cares? You know, Scottish and Danish islands, middle of the North Sea, like what's there? A bunch of sheep, who cares? But actually this is our primary location for tracking Russian submarines coming into the Atlantic, particularly tracking which ones are loaded with nuclear weapons at a time when the leader of Russia keeps saying, I want to use these nuclear weapons. So this is what I mean that we're already in World War III, events are occurring of this magnitude. And maybe this is what modern warfare is gonna look like and should look like. Technology is bearing the burden instead of humans duking it out with blood and guts on a battlefield, but it doesn't make it any less a war. So, all right. So one of the things I always like to do is kind of help people orient themselves back to a battlefield that we've all seen. Right. And, you know, um, I can't help but avoid uh, your line about uh, uh, space, you know, when it's happening out in space. Right. What's the it was aliens, I believe, where, you know, when you scream in space, no one can hear you scream in space. But <laughs> effectively, what they've done is they've created a debris field in their own port. Right. They basically have said, you, you know, we can't use it because you're blockading us but we're gonna create a debris field that prevents you from doing something. Similarly, cutting or destroy, you know, destroying the cables, while it has a cost associated with it for them as well, because they are largely pariahs right now, or at least treated as pariahs within the Western dynamics, effectively this is the equivalent of burning their own field to create confusion and prevent somebody who has the tactical advantage from being up high from seeing the activities on on the battlefield, right? So they're just trying to create the fog of war in an environment in which the US has demonstrated in the last several offenses, whether it was Desert Storm, Desert Shield, et cetera, that we have the capacity 
ability to you know project force in an extraordinary fashion that's just unmatched by anyone else. So what they're trying to do is head that off, right? They're basically saying, we're gonna create the confusion so you can't have that same transparency. Uh, yeah, think of it this way. Um, you know, the last world wars, the last world war was won principally through air power. Um, the first world war, air power didn't come until the very end of the war. Um, and so that was still a, a naval, you know, a naval, Naval environment. And previous to that, we were in mainly naval or land wars, territorial wars. But the new air power is just literally physically higher than it used to be. So instead of airplanes that you can see doing dogfights, it's now being conducted more and more by satellites. Um, and, and again, just to give somebody, everybody, a visual image, there was an incident. Um, in 2021, where the Chinese took their Shijian 21 satellite, which is equipped with robotic arms, which only the United States has otherwise. And basically, they dropped this satellite out of one orbit and into another and grabbed one of their own aging weather satellites and literally hurled it into what they call the dead zone. In other words, it's gone. It's in outer space somewhere and nobody will ever hear from it again. Now that event was very important from a US and NATO perspective because it indicated that we can come along and grab any of your satellites and literally render them useless. And so the threat of that kind of physical warfare between automated robotics is what we're talking about. Um, and again, I think the public, they haven't really understood the automation of warfare, the leaning into AI. By the way, the Chinese just a few months ago announced that they had given control of one of their military satellites to artificial intelligence ostensibly for 24 hours, although nobody knows, is it still under that control? But basically, everybody is trying to get a visual image from the last wars, but that is it's not really smart because it's like, you know, when the Prussian army and the Polish tried to deal with machine guns by riding into them on horseback, like guys, this is so not working. So we've got to reorient everybody's vision away from the past and into the future, which is a very different kind of warfare. And might I just finish on this point, a warfare that is affecting the general public in a very different way. So when the Russians basically took steps that raised the price of energy and raised the price of food so dramatically that we have serious inflation. And you know me, I argued inflation was coming years before this event, but it certainly accelerated an already inflationary environment. You ask the simple question, which creates more civilian damage, a Russian tank or the actions they took that caused global food and energy prices to go up. Answer, weaponization of food and energy was much more powerful. So the fact that we don't recognize that as an act of war is the, our lack of imagination. But that is what warfare looks like now. And it involves more civilians than it did arguably in World War II. So that's a, to me, that's a really interesting way to think about it. I mean, I would describe it very similarly. I mean, you mentioned the dynamics of World War I being a naval war, right? Most people don't think about it that way. They think about it as being, you know, um, all quiet on the Western Front type dynamic of, you know, trench warfare. But the reason that the trench warfare was there was because we had naval blockades in place, right? The Germans right. didn't really have a solution. That was the innovation of the German Wolf Pack in World War II, in which they were suddenly able to break out of the logistically far superior blockades that were relatively straightforward for the British, the Americans, the French, et cetera. So by introducing submarine warfare, they changed those rules as well. So what you're saying is this time around, the rules have again changed. We need to stop thinking about it as kinetic war between two soldiers with M16s or Kalashnikovs, that this is really a story of, we're gonna fight this out with resources in space where the Russians are trying to diminish our superior capability, and the Chinese are basically increasingly demonstrating, hey, we can do a lot of this stuff too. Does that feel like a good way to, to start in that discussion? 
Yeah, and also maybe just as a reminder, what's super crazy is we often have technologies available that we don't use because people have a limited imagination. So one of my favorite sort of superheroes that I would have loved to have met was the uh, very famous, very beautiful actress, Hedy Lamarr, who was an Austrian American who was the darling of Hollywood in the 1930s and 1940s. And she literally was a, a mega scientist in her spare time. And she invented the technology um, that now underpins Bluetooth and our modern GPS. And the reason is because she had been married to a, Germans, a German arms manufacturer and realized what was about to happen, left her husband, bolted to Hollywood, and hooked up with um, uh, an electrical engineer. And her goal was to do something to prevent the German U-boats, the submarines of that era, from taking out civilian vessels, which is what was happening, you remember, in those in, in that period of history. And the she gave the technology to the US Navy. She said, here, I've invented this, just go use it. Well, they literally had no idea what to do with it. They put it on a shelf and they didn't do anything with it until the 19, I think really the 19, six, late 60s, early 70s, when everyone went, oh my God, this technology is incredibly powerful. And of course, now she's in the Engineering Hall of Fame for having done this. This time, because I am around the military defense establishment, because I'm in the tech community, I lecture at Sandhurst, so I spend time with the um, strategic security intelligentsia, my sense is they have very quickly done exactly the same thing, looked around and gone, wait a minute, what have we got on the shelf? that works and that we could deploy quickly. And I'll tell you the one that's intrigued me the most, and I think all of us as investors or people interested in the future of the world economy cannot not know about, which is space-based solar power. And that is something that militaries have had, they know it works, they've thought about it as a weapon system. So the simple idea is you basically have a satellite with let's call it mirrors, they're sophisticated mirrors, but nonetheless, mirrors that catch the sun's rays and convert them either into radio waves or microwaves. In the case of microwaves, you can direct it to a target on Earth and basically burn it to smithereens. But now, because energy prices went through the roof and everybody was like, we need an alternative in a hurry, and somebody went, you know, we've got this thing, and suddenly both Caltech and Airbus have made major announcements in the last 12 months that this works and you can have unlimited green energy from space anytime, anywhere for the electric for electricity and in, in power grids around the world. This is an incredible game changer and it's a strategic security advantage that one cannot take lightly because if you have your own power supply and you don't rely on those gas and oil pipelines anymore, that deeply diminishes Russia's capacity to create pain. So there's a good example of, you know, when we get into the world of warfare, we got to understand what technology is being used or not used. And again, instead, and get away from this whole idea. I mean, it's a kind of, I hate to say it this way, but it's a romantic notion man in fatigues in battlefield with gun, right? It's, it's you know, constantly put in front of us in films and in cartoons and in literature, but this is not what modern warfare is about. Modern warfare, if anything, everybody's working very hard to get the human out of the loop. Um, I could have a lot more to say on that, why we tend now to use special forces probably too heavily because there's this view, well, they can go in and they can just do anything and come out and they're a cheap, easy alternative. But in the end, humans cannot accomplish tasks that technology can. Pippa, looking at this World War III new way of the world going, do you feel that the US is generally in the right direction, what we're doing, how we're managing it? 
Oh, this is a great question. So before I can answer that, let me step back and describe what I mean by World War III, because people still bridle at this language. They're like, no, 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 no. We're just at war in Ukraine. No, I totally disagree. And as examples, General Milley, who is the chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs, recently said we have an underreported military buildup in the Pacific. I think that's completely correct. We have a massive military buildup in the Pacific underway now with China and the United States jockeying for not just influence on island chains around the Pacific, but also for physical footholds and bases. Um, and the Chinese are building new uh, bases using these incredibly sophisticated dredging machines that can literally create an island out in the middle of the Pacific in like two weeks. And so they're referred to as uh, unsinkable aircraft carriers. The US, by the way, was worried that Guam, which is our sort of forward positioned, most sophisticated capability, might get hit. And so we're building a backup that actually will become our, our, our front line, which is on an island called Tinian, uh, just south of Guam. These are all places nobody has heard of. And so there's zero awareness, but there it is. In Europe, we are definitely witnessing warfare in places people aren't watching, like between the various Scandinavian countries and Russia, with cat and mouse games, with submarines, with shipping vessels. Um, and we're more and more seeing this with the Chinese around Taiwan as well, with them circling Taiwan which in my opinion is a strategy designed to force the United States States to spend a ton of money. It's a kind of, we'll bleed you. So we won't attack Taiwan, but we'll make it really expensive for you to maintain the level of alertness that's required to potentially have to respond to this thing. Um, I've already mentioned the space warfare. I think a lot of this now is submarine warfare. This is, a, in, in my judgment, we're used to territorial wars like Iraq, Afghanistan. The idea that we're in a naval warfare environment now is hard for people to understand because, again, they don't see the submarine warfare. The one place where we do have land territorial warfare, which, again, the West doesn't focus on, is Africa. And that's where the Wagner Group, which has been President Putin's private army until recently, where they're having a bit of a mutiny and uh, reorganization of the power structure. But fundamentally, that private mercenary army controls the oil fields in Libya. It's behind all the violence in what they call the Sahel, which is the Sahara Desert region, Mali, for example, where the French have just been pushed out. Um, and they have deep ties all the way into Central African Republic, Mozambique, Madagascar, South Africa. And recently you saw uh, the navies, the Chinese, the Russian, and the South African navies all holding exercises together. So when I say we're in World War III, I would go further and say there are more countries involved in what I'm describing than there were at the start of World War II. But because people aren't tracking this, they don't notice that the Sudan and just gave a military capable port to the Russians on the Red Sea. They're not aware that, you know, Tinian is being built very quickly. And so it's a really hard conversation because people have a, a visual image that it's all about Ukraine, when in fact there's all this other stuff going on. And that means you can't possibly understand the complexity of the negotiation project pro progress, or sorry, process that will bring it to an end if you don't understand what's actually in play. And so I'll people going the right way, the wrong way. So again, this is super hard. I think that the US fundamentally adopted an arguably sensibly arrogant position, could be argued against, but basically their arrogant position was Russia is a tiny has been, they'll never dare actually use their nuclear arsenal. So this will all just peter out. They have the same view on China, which is they've never been at war for the last you know, three generations. They have no experience there. They may have some technology, but they have no idea how to run 
a, a modern military in a major battlefield environment. So basically we just wait them out. And then as things started to accelerate on both fronts, there came the realization of, oh my gosh, we are actually facing Russia and China together. Now, a two front war environment is definitely something the US is not prepared for. And the realization that Russia might actually try to use its nuclear arsenal and the realization that what would we do in response? And I think personally that the conclusion of the US military has been, we might not do anything because it's not worth destroying planet earth Right, the old mutual assured destruction, they hit us with a nuke and we whack them back with 10. This doesn't work in a world where our nuclear capability is so far advanced compared to where we were in World War II. I mean, just to give you an idea, you know, on some of these Russian submarines, you've got nuclear weapons that are literally, you know, a hundred times more powerful than Hiroshima. And we've already exploded nuclear weapons in the Pacific in test environments that were, you know, literally a, a huge multiple of Hiroshima. So this isn't like just one, you know, nuke with that kind of capability. This is respond and Earth doesn't exist anymore. So suddenly everybody went, oh gosh, okay. Uh, basically it's checkmate on nuclear. So we're going to have to find ways to negotiate with these folks. And that's what Putin and Xi have been banking on, is that in the end, the arrogance of the United States will force them to the negotiating table. Now, I think in the end, the U.S. is going to do fine out of this and the West will do fine. We can go into the details of that. But arrogance was driving the early part of this process, and it's not now. Let me have one more question. I, I, you did a terrific uh, show with um, Eric on Apple Voices. We, we can change the go, so I don't want to go and repeat all that. People just go listen to it. He's amazing. Um, but uh, specific, you proposed the notion that basically the Russian military is kind of like the establishment, and then Putin is kind of like, you know, and the GRU is like the spies who kind of hostily took over Russia. Um, looking, now it's been 10 days from your last comment, what the hell happened here? It seems to me that this whole thing was stagecraft because for, for Prigozhin to go walk into unarmed into Putin's nest and Putin is surrounded by guys with guns. If he goes, I mean, I, I saw the mafia movie, they all kill him. So, so for him to feel safe to walk into that, he had had, this, was this all set up between Putin and, 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 and Belarus and, and Prigozhin? Yeah, you know, and I wrote, I did write a piece called Russian Theater, um, and this is literally theatrical. Um, and, you know, so for background, again, some of you guys will know my dad, um, who served Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. And Nixon, when he decided to open the dialogue with the Russians and the communists generally, he sent Kissinger to Beijing and he sent my dad to Moscow. So my family has had an involvement with the story of Russia for a very long time. And I have to tell you, Kremlinology in the old days was easy compared to what we're witnessing now, right? Everybody's like, it's crazy. We have more technology and actually more human connections between the West and the Russians and the Chinese, and yet far less visibility and understanding of, you know, who's on first, like what the heck is going on? What, what does seem clear is that when the Soviet Union fell apart back in, um, you know, 89, the West and the U.S. in particular took a view that they would just become capitalist because what else would you do, right? Your system failed. You're coming to our side and welcome. Let's, you know, start bringing everything to the stock market and not understanding that they had no understanding of it, no tradition of it. And so what happened was the intelligence services of the old Soviet Union morphed into the power leadership of that country. And this is a little harsh to say, but I think basically the intelligence community aligned itself with organized crime. And so that is one group, it's referred to as the Siloviki. And so you're either with them 
or you're an enemy of them, right? It's, it's kind of like it's a gang. Now, Putin is the head of that gang. And the other side was the military. The military have never profited from Putin's leadership. They didn't get payouts that, you know, the intelligence community got. They didn't have the oligarchs with them, but they're a very proud bunch. And fundamentally, they do control the nuclear arsenal, right? Not Putin, because it's not like you just hit a button and it goes, right? There's a command structure and execution process. And so now that Putin started asking the military to execute a nuclear strike, they started to say, wait a minute, why are, why do, why are we doing this again? Why do we want to bring around the end of the world? Why do we want to get into a conflict with the U.S.? Because we didn't benefit from anything. And wait, what's in it for us? And is this good for the earth? And remember, the Russians also have had several incidents in history where Russian um, military staff have averted nuclear catastrophes because they decided to use their better judgment instead of automatically responding to systems telling them that there were inbound nuclear weapons. So they are capable of saying no. And we know it happened because the guy who carried Putin's nuclear codes um, roughly two years ago, 18 months ago, so was suddenly um, dead by suicide, but it was two bullets to the back of the head. So you're like, well, the second one was really impressive, but it's kind of obvious that he was asked to do something and he said no. And so there's a fight between the Siloviki and the military. And that's exactly what we witnessed with this whole thing. And the Siloviki and Wagner Group is the private army of the Siloviki. So they have been the source of cash for Putin. And it's really important to distinguish between the Russian economy and its state versus the Putin economy and its state. The Putin economy has been booming and he's making a ton of money out of Wagner's operations in Africa. The Russian economy has been quite up the creek, two very different things. So I don't know exactly, but what seems clear is that Many of the Wagner Group members did indeed hand their weapons over to the Russian army. And there's been a change of power in the Russian army structure. And um, uh, Valery Gerasimov, who's the you know, most respected, most senior person in the Russian military, who had been appointed to be in charge of Ukraine, is out. And now what we don't know is who's going to emerge from this power struggle someone from the Siloviki or someone from the military. And the last thing I'll say on this is weirdly, I've argued that Washington would be delighted if we end up with a military dictator because that we can work with. But if it ends up with somebody like Prigozhin, who is a ruthless mercenary who would not hesitate to use the nuclear weapons and thinks that Putin is soft, that is not a very pretty outcome. Now, we're, we, we're a, um, a financial investment kind of show here in theory. Um, so kind of segueing full sideways, um, and I'll let Mike pick this up. But by the way, um, I'm glad that you were a believer in inflation. I, too, was a believer in inflation. Some of us were not believers of inflation, but they're, you know, whatever, licking their wounds. With, you're sitting at this you know, matrix, you know, juncture of the White House and politics and the military. Bidenomics, as such as they are, what is what's your projection of, of, of are these policies good? Are they bad? Not not buying stocks or bonds, but like the overall U.S. economy and inflation. What do you think about these things? And Mike, you could jump in and defend yourself. <laughs> well, before you Pippa, before you answer that, okay. um, I actually want to. We have a, a question in the Q and A that I think actually feeds into this, which is: Can the U.S. afford to police the world? Right. And they're very similar because ultimately we're talking about the dynamic of how much of the inflationary experience we had was tied to monetary policy, how much of it was tied to the Russian activities, as you highlighted, and the sanctions that were put on top of Russia, and how much of it is just bad political choices, right? Bad fiscal policy or bad monetary policy. That really does matter, particularly as we think about it going forward, because if the question from my standpoint is, you know, we either spend this money 
or the world ends up in a very different and unrecognizably worse place from the American household standpoint, then it's not really a question of, you know, can we afford to do it? It's a question of what do we have to give up in order to afford to do it? And that, that feels like an important distinction as we start talking about good versus bad policies in this dynamic. Yeah, so let's just back up a little bit. So my argument was, uh, which I made publicly really starting around 20, uh, 2013, 2014, was that the cost of the financial market bailout was that we would see the return of inflation and the return of geopolitics. And that's what I then made the case for in my book, uh, which was called Signals, the Breakdown of the Social Contract and the Rise of Geopolitics. And then the publisher changed the name to Signals Everyday Signs that can help us navigate the world's turbulent economy, because that was easier for people to understand. <laughs> but at that time, people were like, you're insane. Inflation is dead. It's never coming back. And we won the Cold War. So we got a peace dividend forever. There is no geopolitics returning. And I was like, no, you watch. And sure enough, inflation began to pick up at that time. Now, albeit slowly, it was a gradual process, but it was showing already. We went from you know pretty much zero to 3% way before anything happened with regard to Russia and Ukraine, way before. Now, people in the markets will be like, oh, zero to 3%, you know, it's still within the band, it's totally acceptable. Yeah, it is a huge impact on a poor person, massive. And it's a massive impact on a pension fund portfolio. And it's a really big hit in an emerging market, especially countries that are fragile in inflation environments. Now, the two fragile countries that have a long history of political instability once inflation appears are China and Russia. And they get very focused on, I have to have enough food to feed my people. And so they get very uh, territory aggressive, which is what China's done with their Belt and Road strategy, which is building out you know, physical infrastructure, railways, um, digital, um, digital highways, physical highways, all designed to bring food and energy home at a time when prices are rising. So to me, these two things are totally inextricable, but the Federal Reserve's position is we had nothing to do with this and inflation and geopolitics have never met and they don't have anything to do with each other either. So, and they gave Ben Bernanke a Nobel prize for doing all this. And I'm still sitting here making this darn argument. So <laughs> you'll have to judge you know, who's right on this, but that's takes We're us to where we are. Ben We're not bringing Ben Bernanke onto keeping it simple anytime. Okay, okay. So okay. Simple. You hang with a better crowd. Okay. So I, I, wanted to, I wanted to push back on this for a second though, because because uh, so so first it is very clear that politics and inflation are inextricably linked right there is no way to separate the two when resources are required this is effectively the question i just asked yeah. when resources are required for national security you spend them right and you stop worrying about you know how much is it going to cost and how is it going to adversely affect various wealthy people around the united states right which has been a huge part of what we've experienced. We've experienced the marginal buyer of homes has been shut out of the market. We've experienced, you know, um, a lot of these dynamics and the people at the lower end who we traditionally think of as being hammered by inflation are typically the elderly on fixed pensions who don't have the capacity. And ironically, we've actually inflation adjusted them to the best situation they've ever been in, right? I mean, the the levels of satisfaction and comfort, you know, comfortability amongst those who already have their homes, already have their mortgage largely paid off, or in fixed rate, already have a uh, social security that is inflation adjusted, already are tied into financial assets that have appreciated significantly, and now have money sitting in the bank because the definition of being wealthy almost by you know is almost inextricably linked to being old. We're actually seeing those who have money in the bank are now generating significant additional income, right? Well, so that's, that's true for us old folks, but that's not been true. And who is it hit the hardest? It's actually hit the young. Right. Um, so you know, look, inflation hits different members of society in different ways. But 
what I think is really important is um, it's this concept of justice in monetary policy, right? The reason that we talk about price stability is because government shouldn't be intervening on behalf of the speculators at the expense of the savers or vice versa. The reason you try to keep prices stable is that so those two camps, and you're talking about the speculators in a sense, the people who had capital to invest, who owned assets, who owned the stock market, of course, they've benefited massively from the bailout and then from you know uh, gradual inflation that actually raises the value of their assets over time. But the savers or the speculators, the, the, the young who didn't have them, they aren't a beneficiary. So basically it's about making decisions and understanding that they're gonna impact on different members of society differently. What, what matters now is where do we go from here? And I think that we're all caught up in inflation levels that are temporary. I do now see that technology is going to bring us a level of abundance that we cannot even imagine. And if I'm right about space-based solar power, then we're gonna see a collapse in energy prices and probably the demise of the entire hydrocarbon sector altogether. And we can get into resources. I see something on that front too. So I don't think inflation's going to remain our biggest problem. I think we will come back to a very deflationary world that right now nobody is thinking about. But what matters is the navigation from one to the other is a constant process. And what we did was we got too cocky and said, oh, inflation's dead, and then took a ton of risks. And suddenly now inflation and all of its allies like geopolitics have roared back to life, like the Valkyries on a, on a battlefield. Yep. So I, I, like I, you're doing so well for so long. You, and, and now you're going back to deflation oh, again. Ugh, broke my heart. Harley, see, this, this, this is the problem. Like those who have actually spent time on this understand that the conditions are really not in place for meaningful inflation. And it is hard to sustain as we're seeing. It's fallen in exactly a transitory fashion, whether you'd like to accept it or not. The or PC is four six services is four percent. You know, I mean, and 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 you know, we're we're, we're, we're we, boomers are all retiring, and people want to buy stuff. I mean, we're, we're sitting at three four percent inflation for, for quite a while, in my view. I'm so looking that's forward, where I stand. I'm looking forward to you being wrong yet again. The the. <laughs> The, the By the way, can I just jump in on that point? Because yeah. there is something that's really important, which is um, two things. One is the inflation rate is an average. It represents a spectrum. So some people's inflation rate is running at 10 percent and some mm -hmm. people's inflation rate is running at one. Right. It, your life defines your vulnerability. So we have to take into consideration that there's a pain level that is not reflected by the official number that we all rely on. That's just a, an average, as it were. So the pain is what matters in society, because that's what creates actions that move markets rather than the inflation number. And second of all, the, it's all relative. So like when I was a kid coming out of college, which is like a thousand years ago, basically interest rates were 7%. And I we thought that was pretty good. We were like, wow, that's amazing because we could remember when they were 21%. Today, we have young kids, they're like, no, no, no. In, inflation should be zero or one. And you tell them it's going to be six and they're having a heart attack. Right. So it's all your personal experience of the thing influences your capacity to manage the situation. But absolutely, did we manage at 21%? Yeah, there was a lot of pain, but there was a lot of adjustment that happened that was positive too. So it just it's it's your attitude. I mean, it's again, we're humans, it's social science. I actually just wanted to share this slide to, to highlight some of the points that Pippa's making. This is looking at what's called the flexible CPI which is the basket that is created not by contractual relationships, but by what happens when you go to the grocery store, what happens when you go to the gas station, et cetera. 
And to Pippa's point, I mean, we actually were running 26% on an annualized basis for the flexible inflation at the peak of the, the um, uh, time period in which, you know, Harley was arguing for a continued acceleration and persistence of inflation. So we're, and that was actually higher than the inflations that we saw in the 1970s, right? So this was truly an extraordinary inflation that occurred, but it's in the rear view mirror. And to hold on to it, Harley, is much like adopting a comb over. It doesn't look good and it just doesn't fool anyone. Mike, you're, 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 you're just playing with, with a shell game with people. When, when inflation was high a year ago at 9% CPI, you said, well, look at core, it's six. And now that CPI is, is, is a three, you're beating your chest, but core's a 4.9. Pick one or the other. You, you keep picking different metrics. All I know is last time I checked, you were long bonds and that didn't work. It has okay, Pippa, we're, we're gonna fight each other. Back to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bidenomics, is, is, such as they are, good or bad as, as, as things go? Well, look, first of all, as somebody who's worked in the White House, the president does not control this. So that we're asking the wrong question. Um, the people at the Federal Reserve, in my opinion, they, they're the ones who made this decision and now they're all in denial about it. So this is a problem. They got rid of all the hawks at the Fed. They've ended up with a completely dovish crowd over there that genuinely believe that they can control the outcome. I, I would go, I know I'm probably gonna get quoted on this, but I would go so far as to say they kind of became so overconfident, they started to think like the old Soviet Union, that they could literally control the temperature dial on inflation. And you know, if it went too high, we could just adjust it a little. But I remember I was very privileged to work a little bit with Paul Volcker during his lifetime. And he used to say, you know, you will once you let this thing out of the bag, you will not have control. And it will take a lot of pain to get the control back. So I think the problem is we've got technocrats who are overconfident. And that is a very typical thing, no matter what the subject matter. So that's one thing. Second thing is, I don't think Biden is going to be president after this term. Uh, and so the more important question for markets now is what comes next. Um, you know, especially on this particular point of inflation. So clearly, me... wait, 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 I, I want to shotgun over here because World War III is boring and economics, like, who really cares? <laughs> RFK, <laughs> RFK, Gavin Newsom. Where do we stand? I am going to tell you, it's so shocking. I think it's going to be RFK. As and let me, let nominees. me. Well, I think he's going to win. So Ooh. let me let me put it this way. I said in 20, I think it was in the end of 2015, that Donald Trump could and was very likely to become president. And people were like, are you completely insane? Like, seriously, this is never, ever going to happen. And to be clear, this is, this was a prediction rather than a preference. It was just a view that I think this is what's coming. And people were like, it's just impossible. And then we, it happened. I have the same degree of conviction now that this view that it's impossible, it means it's very like, we, we really have a high probability of this. So I can walk you through the reasons why if you want. But um, Youngkin, I don't think will have, he'll be like DeSantis. There's just not enough substance, mojo, charisma, any of the things that are really required. And there are these other candidates that do have these things that the public has been consistently hungry for since the president I worked for, George W. Bush. And, and maybe that's the thing to explain. Since George W. Bush, actually really even before that, to be honest, the public has wanted an outsider to come into Washington and clean it up. So consistently, we love electing somebody that nobody ever heard of three years before. No one ever heard of Bill Clinton three years before. I mean, like nobody. George W., everybody laughed. They went, that's not possible. Nobody heard of Obama. Even two years before, people were like, who's that? And nobody heard of Trump as a serious possibility. 
So bottom line, we love the underdog, the dark horse, the totally unexpected. We consistently go for that. And we love the people who are, we think are outside the system enough that they can come in and clean it up. Now, I think we're not going to change our stripes. So we're going to do the same thing again. And so who is the ultimate anti, you know, anti-establishment dark horse outsider right now? That is RFK. But there's even further reasons why he addresses many of the issues that the public take most seriously. And because he was so marginalized by the mainstream media and banned, you know, from the social media platforms, there is nothing to make you more popular than being banned. And now that he's back on those, there, then the, the last thing to say is also technology is the key. And presidencies are determined not just by personalities, they're determined by tech. And so Bill Clinton won the presidency on Saturday Night Live playing the saxophone. That was the moment he was a television president. Then Obama won it on YouTube. And he won it with very small campaign contributions of $100 or less. Then Trump won on Twitter. And this president is going to win on podcasts. And podcasts are the key because you get to choose your interviewer and you get like three hours with an audience that's bigger than CNN if you go on with Joe Rogan. And suddenly sound bites will be over and everyone will sit and listen to the deep, deep dive into real detail and history of policymaking and watch how RFK goes from 20% support right out of the gate to ever increasing numbers. Okay, he wins, he does well in, in Iowa and New Hampshire. You don't think the Democrats come in and um, draft uh, Newsom? I mean, Newsom was pretty good on Hannity, wasn't he? They're gonna try. But uh, there's no doubt there's going to be a showdown between RFK and Newsom. But here's another level of this or layer of this. Fundamentally, RFK's policies are very similar to Trump. And so are DeSantis's and so are Francis Suarez's, the mayor of Miami, who's now the head of the Council of Mayors and someone who's probably not the winner for this time, but an up and coming voice. Those guys all have a very similar position, which is they are pro entrepreneurs. They don't believe in higher taxes. So that'll separate RFK from uh, Yunkin, for example. So the, the entrepreneurial class of America will recognize basically a conservative Democrat and a liberal Republican in the form of RFK. Whereas Yunkin and some of the other alternatives, they're much further left in the let's hit the rich, that's how you solve the problem. And I just think the appetite for that amongst Democrats is not that high. Amongst Republicans, the appetite for a liberal, a liberal Republican, someone who says government should stop at your door, um, you shouldn't, you know, have to worry about Roe versus Wade being overturned. And I do think abortion will be one of the key issues of this next election. And suddenly you have a Democrat saying, I believe in Roe versus Wade. I believe that states should make their own rules, but the federal government should not be weighing in on this. And a whole bunch of Republicans are going to go, well, actually, that's where I am, too. And mainly the last thing is the African-American community. And bottom line is, is the Democrats always take them for granted. They assume they're going to vote Democrat. But most of the African-American community are entrepreneurs because they had to be, because the system did not open their doors to them. And as entrepreneurs, they hear the, I'll keep your tax rates low because you're building the future. And, might, and even more so, Kennedy has said, very important issue, he would seek to release from incarceration anyone who's in prison on minor marijuana charges. And that means every single, pretty much, African-American family, somehow or another, does have someone in that terrible position. Obviously, a lot of white America does too. A lot of Hispanic America does too. And frankly, a lot of people are gonna go, I vote for that. And nobody has better credentials on civil rights than RFK. 
day. I think Politico called him the most trusted white man in black America. And if he can swing that African-American vote and that vote in the middle, I just don't even see how Young can, can even have a conversation with him. So I, I have up a screen that I actually uh, had put in front of me today. This is the uh, Harvard Harris poll, right? Mm. And it, it says something that I think is actually really interesting in this context. If you notice in terms of the overall favorable, Kennedy is right next to Trump. But the really critical thing here is the unfavorability. He is off the charts in terms of favorable versus unfavorable compared to anyone else. Exactly to Pippa's point about an outsider, the only person who actually is showing similar numbers, Elon Musk, Ron DeSantis, a little bit. Um, Hillary Clinton is, of course, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Hillary Clinton is hugely negative. Tim Scott is positive. And then Vivek, right? But all of these are Washington outsiders for the most part. Robert Kennedy benefits from something else, though, which is he has total name recognition, whether it's because they think he's his father or whether they think he's his uncle. It's not entirely clear. I wouldn't put it past the American public on any of this. But look at this no opinion. I would effectively say that Pippa has a really great point. It's his to lose. And if people choose to introduce themselves to him through podcasts, give him the hour or two hours to get to know him. And this is really, with Biden not participating in debates, this could really work to his favor. You actually end up in a situation where this could very well be the stalking horse. You know, the the low favorability rests on one issue, which is vaccinations. And the core answer that RFK is giving is he's never been against vaccinations. He's against unsafe testing regimes mm -hmm. for vaccinations. And if you ask the public, you go, would you which do you prefer, safe or unsafe testing procedures for vaccines before they're released into the public? Everybody's like, well, of course I want a safe one. So then it becomes an issue of, do we have a safe process? Now you can get into a debate about that, but he's been described by the mainstream media as anti-vaxxer when in fact he was in favor of many vaccines in history. And he has a long history of being involved with this issue, but he felt that the procedures around the COVID vaccine were fundamentally done in an unsafe way. Now that will lead to a public debate about whether or not that's true, but I think this moniker that he was you know nuts because he was against the vaccine is just literally dissolving what's also important is the number one political issue in america since the 1950s which everyone always underestimates or forgets is clean water that is literally the number one issue every family will cite that they care about now who has the best record on that robert f kennedy literally rolled his sleeves up what, 40 years ago and said, the Hudson River is dead. It's dead from Manhattan, halfway up New York. And he said, I'm gonna clean it up. And he did, and now it's an alive river having been dead. So he's all about, I did it. I cleaned up the water supply of a major tributary in America. People care about the cleanliness of the water. So he can get attacked for what he says is in the water, but the reality is there's a huge sympathy across America and people are tired of stuff being in their water and foodstuffs that they don't understand and shouldn't be in there. When people, uh, right before uh, Trump won, the idea was if Trump wins, sell everything, we're going to hell in a handbasket, um, yeah. which, which well, I kind of did, but um, the stock market went up. Um, RFK wins, do you buy or sell? So to be clear, I've argued that um, defense spending has become the new quantitative easing. So when we want to throw money into the economy, it's happening through defense spending in recent years. If RFK wins, it isn't going to go in defense spending anymore because he's all about why are we conducting these foreign adventures? We should come home. But that money will get diverted into things like cleaning up the water supply of the United States, building the infrastructure of the country or rebuilding it in ways that work. He will definitely attack the pharma and agricultural sector. So, you know, companies like Monsanto and 
and um, defense companies are going to find their share price gets hit if he becomes president. No question about it. But it doesn't mean the stock market goes down because this is a guy who's pro entrepreneurship, low taxes, wants business to create the solutions for the future. So I think actually we'll see the startup culture get a big lift and we'll see anything related to the greenness of the environment also getting a lift. And that doesn't mean the old green washing. That means the actual cleaning up of the environment that we live in. So I'm not sure the stock market goes down, but the allocation of capital within it will in probably radically change. So one of the things that we've seen, Harley, in, in each of the last couple of elections has been the sell-off ahead of it, as people basically ask the question exactly as you're saying and try to get ahead of it. And the minute the uncertainty is resolved, it doesn't really matter who it is. The stock market rallies as money flows back in, or at least doesn't flow out. Pippa, you have been super generous with our time. You have got to get to a rap concert with your daughter. So this <laughs> provides the perfect opportunity for us to say goodbye um, but there, there were a number of comments, you know, just excellent program, et cetera. Um, there was one that I actually wanted to, to, to hit one last question with you on RFK, okay. which is, is he going to run as a Democrat or would he run as a third party? Because I... it strikes me as very plausible that the Democratic Party shuts him out and goes Newsom. I think they'll try, but if they see that they won't win, then they're going to readjust, which is why I say the whole process of choosing the nominee may be very, very different this time than what we're used to. But let's throw another wrench in this. RFK and Trump get on really well. And both Suarez and RFK are Bitcoiners as, as well, which is going to be really crazy. Two American political candidates that are young, full of energy, and they both are for a pro Bitcoin and pro environment. This is gonna change the whole debate. So what if we end up with something truly bipartisan, which RFK has said he's very committed to? What if you ended up with an RFK that Trump says he likes and swings the Trump vote, and one that a lot of the Democrats also quite like, as I said, the African American community, you could find it in a situation where the Democratic Party simply can't control what the outcome here is. And will, Trump need a presidential pardon? Quite possibly. And so I think he'll be awfully friendly with Suarez and um, RFK. And would they two, would those two work together? I'd be very interested to see if we could possibly see Suarez and RFK, because what are they going to argue about? They agree yeah. on almost everything. Well, so that was the last question. So um, if when I think about RFK, it strikes me as his his biggest risk is that he chickens out at the end and he accepts the vice presidential nomination. Do you think there's a risk of that? I think there's a real possibility. And I think, by the way, another reason why the Biden team are having trouble controlling all this narrative is because people feel that now that a vote for Biden is really a vote for Kamala, for Kamala Harris. And whatever your views are on her, she is, for whatever reason, not seen as a candidate that most people are comfortable, with, which I think has nothing to do with her color, her ethnicity. I think it's more to do with the way she approaches issues. But that's another reason I think people might go, you know what, the traditional Democratic Party candidate isn't Yunkin, it's the vice president. And is that the outcome the country wants. Well, it certainly feels like that's going to change. Okay, so we've stolen even more of your time, and um, we've answered some fantastic questions. Harley has discovered that as much as he'd like to stick with the inflation trade, he's going to have to abandon it. Um, and so we're going to let Brian uh, see us out here. Thank you again, Pippa. I'm so thank glad you were you. able to join Thank us. you for having me. Thank you, Pippa. This was a really awesome conversation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll have a replay available in the next couple of days, and then we'll post the, we'll post the replay on, uh, on our YouTube channel. Please check out Pippa's Substack at uh, drpippa.subs, uh, excuse me, drpippa.substack.com, and then join us for Brent Johnson on uh, August 10th on Keeping It Simple. But everyone, thank you so much for joining us, and have a great evening. Thank you.